Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Nineveh this morning. Let's all stand as we worship. You're my 
portion and I believe you're more than enough for me and Jesus you're all I need you hold my every moment and you call
this is the desire of our heart. And set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. Yes, I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Yes, I want more of you, God. Yes, I want more of just you all. Than here in your love, 
here in your life. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. And I want more of you, God. Yes, I want more of you, God. And set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. And I want more of you. Just you all. I will give a commercial while they're going out. Um, uh, starting two weeks ago, all of the, um, every service on Sunday morning is videoed and uh, is on the website. You can go to the website and it'll link to YouTube. The full service is on there, the music, the preaching. Uh, starting this past week, it's on Channel 6 of local cable channel, Friday nights at 9 o'clock and Monday afternoons at 5 o'clock. Um, we didn't get any prime time slots, that's all that was open, but... Uh, uh, I've had several this morning come to me and said they saw it for the first time on cable channel 6. So uh, uh, the point is this, if you've got a computer, you've got a friend, maybe there's somebody you're working with uh, to share the good news of Christ and you say, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you connect and watch this particular sermon? Um, the podcasts are on there forever. Uh, they've been on there for a long time, but the, the actual video of our services is available as well. So take advantage of that. Have you ever had or seen or experienced something that was so profound you couldn't wait to tell somebody? Come on. You've seen something, been a part of something, and you just are itching to tell somebody about it because you didn't want it just to be for you. You wanted to be able to share it. Have you ever heard anyone say anything that in itself was rather deep or complex, but they explained it in a way in which you just get it. I mean, you really get it. And when I have those moments, and I had one recently, when I have those moments, I, I, I want to take full advantage of them. I had that experience recently. I want to describe it to you, and I've used this analogy before. To me, it's like the cartoon character light bulb moment that you're watching the cartoons and the little guy has the bulb come on and it illuminates and a ding noise happens and that means the little fella's got it. Well, recently I had a light bulb moment. Um, it was incredible and here's why. I have no idea where it came from. But I was in my office one day several weeks ago and I am cleaning off my computer desk and I've got a bunch of stuff over there by the computer, and I'm just trying to clean up. It kind of gotten piled up, and I'm going through some uh, CDs and DVDs that are laying over there. And I come across a, a, DVD, a, a, a CD, excuse me, a CD that's wrapped in plastic. It's never been opened. I have no idea how, where it came from or how it got in my office. It's by a guy named Ray Comfort, and... The title of it caught my eye. The title of it was Hale's Best Kept Secret. And I thought, you know, I probably ought to know the best kept secret about Hale. So I slit the thing open and popped it in the computer one day and I listened to it. And I want to tell you, I had a light bulb moment. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that particular CD, but you're going to hear the illustration part of it today because it is the best illustration for the point that I want to try to make today, I have ever seen or been a part of. Um, today, it is my goal. It is my prayer to cover some of that light bulb moment uh, that Ray Comfort used as an illustration on that CD. And here's why. I, like many people in the ministry, are confounded by the great falling away that's taking place in the American culture. In fact, I'm going to tell you, it is maybe the, one of the heaviest things that I experience personally is to watch the great apostasy, which is the great falling away. I'm watching it. I don't know that you're seeing it like I'm seeing it, but I'm going to tell you, I am appalled, I am amazed, I'm complexed, I'm confounded by the great falling away. 
And the reason this sermon today is a light bulb moment for me, perhaps more than anything I have ever seen or heard, it probably describes the source of the great falling away that's taking place in the church. And that needs to be communicated to the American Christian church. I've read different statistics, but the numbers are disturbing and huge regarding the amount of people Here's, the, here's what I'm looking at. The amount of people that at some point in their lives have made a confession of faith, but have eventually left their faith and left the church. I am appalled by the number of people that at some point in their life have made a confession of faith, maybe experienced a baptism, and then for some reason or a series of reasons have left the church, left the faith. Do you know how rare it is to be part of this church right now? Do you know how many churches are in the increase versus the decline? The American church overall is in decline. The number of people that attend church in America is not increasing. I hope you realize you're involved in a phenomena here of a church that has for 13 years, every year, experienced consistent, supernatural, huge growth. Why? Why? I think by the end of the day, you might be able to put your finger on a part of that. I'm going to begin today with this verse. It's found in the book of Psalms, chapter 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. You know, you're not going to find very many things that are perfect, but I'm going to tell you, the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The perfect law of the Lord revives. Some translations use the word converts the soul. Now here's the baseline. Everybody's got to get this part. The law of the Lord, the law of the Lord revives the soul. What does it mean revives? It puts me back into a life-giving relationship with God. Apart from God, there will only be death. I have to be with God to experience life. Let's go back to the beginning. Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam was perfect. Adam and Eve were perfect. They were living in a perfect world with a perfect God. Everything is perfect until sin. Sin caused something to happen. Adam and Eve were separated from the presence of God. Remember the story? There was a curse given to Adam, a curse given to Eve, a curse given to the serpent. But really something else happened. What they used to experience, they were no longer able to experience when the righteous, holy God could no longer have a relationship, not like it was, with an unrighteous, unholy Adam and Eve. So there was a separation. There was a fiery sword put uh, with angels over the gate of the Garden of Eden so they couldn't partake of the tree of life. But the, the deal is this, there was a separation that took place. That separation continued all the way up to the time of the flood. There was a separation. God had some encounters with people. He had an encounter with Noah, but it was not the same. Not like Adam walking with God in the cool of the day. Not like that. So there's the flood. God gets people back down to eight people. After the flood, there's a few generations that take place. A man rises up named Abraham. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 boys. Next thing you know, there's the tribe of the the family of Israel, Jacob's children. And eventually they find themselves in Egypt. And here comes a guy in a burning bush named Moses. You know what God's going to announce to Moses? Now this is big. God's going to announce to Moses that he's going to come back to the earth and allow his presence to once again dwell with people. It won't be exactly like it was in the Garden of Eden where Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Perfect Adam, perfect God, perfect world. But it'll be a temporary substitute in which he will come back. But before he comes back, do you know what he had to do? Do you know what God required to happen before he would come back? You're probably thinking, what do you mean he came back? They're going to build what? They're going to build a sanctuary. They're going to build a tabernacle, a mobile tent. 
and it's very specific instructions in which God, the very presence, glory of God, will descend over the Ark of the Covenant and be in the presence of the people of Israel, right? But before any of that can happen, before God can descend into the presence of people again, reviving the soul with the presence of the life of God, guess what had to happen? The law. God was going to describe to Moses in detail the rules in which it would take for him to live with man. He gave ten of them on stone tablets, ten things that you must do. Actually, if you get into the detail, there's about 613 mitzvahs that the Jewish people were given in the Levitical law. But ten basic fundamental rules. And what was the purpose of those rules? This is the, these are the conditions it will take for me to come and be in your presence, reviving yourself. This is what it will take. Now understand, that's the baseline we start on. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. In this verse, what is it that revives, converts the soul of man? The law. The law revives. It opens up our ability to have a relationship with the life giver. The law of the Lord, the word of the Lord as he has given it, what? Made a way for God and man to coexist without man being utterly destroyed by his glory and his holiness. Thus the law. Now, let me give you an illustration. Here's the illustration. What if I told you that this past week somebody went into the Anderson County Courthouse and paid on your behalf a $25,000 speeding ticket. You're going to first think, I heard you laughing, you're going to first think, whoa, that's a whopper. What if I told you that somebody went into the Anderson County Courthouse on your behalf and paid a $25,000 speeding fine? Now, first you would look at me and you would think I am foolish because you would think I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. And because I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine, it's pretty foolish of you to go in there and pay that on my behalf. You just lost $25,000. You would probably find my comment offensive. If you really sit and think about it a while, you would probably find me offensive for even saying that because you would think, are you calling me a lawbreaker? Not just a lawbreaker, a, a monumental lawbreaker that, to break a law that would cost $25,000 in fines. It sounds like I'd be calling you a lawbreaker. But, 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 what if then, after I'd paid your fine, you find out that you had done something. You find out, now stay with me, that you had actually driven through a major intersection of a blind, deaf school that was posted 15 miles per hour and you went through that 15 hour miles per hour blind deaf school intersection at 55 but you didn't know you had done that you didn't actually do it on purpose you didn't know you had done it but you had done it nonetheless and guess what in the fine print in the laws of the state of Kentucky in Anderson County the fine for going 55 and a 15 in a blind deaf school intersection is $25,000 However, today, a person came into the courthouse and paid your fine in full, $25,000. I would say to you, you're very fortunate. I'd probably say also slow down. But I would say to you, you're very fortunate. However, listen, here's the point. Until you realize or realize that you had actually broken the law, it was foolishness to you. That entire conversation. Until you realize that you had actually broken a speed limit law that had a $25,000 fine fixed to it, to you, some guy going into the courthouse paying your fine is foolishness. Somebody coming to you and saying that you had broken the law is foolishness. Until you realize, until you acknowledge that I really did. I really did go 55 and a 15 in a blind deaf school intersection and I'm in trouble. But until you get it, Guess what? How foolish it is. And number two, how foolish I am to come and tell you about it. Hold that thought. If you or I 
go to an unbelieving person, somebody who does not believe in Jesus, an unbelieving sinner, and say that Jesus died on a cross for you, guess what? It is foolishness to him. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why? Because they don't know they broke a the law. They have no idea that the law is in place and that they just broke the law. The message of the cross is foolishness to an unbeliever, right? Foolish. And not only foolish, I want you to get something. It is not only foolish, it is offensive. When you tell somebody they're a lawbreaker and they're really not even clear what the law was. It's offensive to them. They're probably going to get mad at you. Because why? Because let's think about it. It doesn't make any sense. If they don't know about the law, none of it makes any sense. Because he doesn't yet know that he's violated the laws of God. That's why the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why? They don't know they're a lawbreaker. They don't realize that they've just violated the laws of God. Telling someone that Jesus has come to pay your fine is foolish to somebody who doesn't know or think that they've broken the law in the first place. But if I were to take the time to open the law, what if I take a different position? What if I, what if I were to take the time to open the law, the Word, and show him that he's offended God by violating his divine, divine law? It might begin to make sense. Maybe you would read this verse that I read a moment ago different. Psalms 19.7, again. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The law and my standing under the law would clear up the question about why Jesus came to die for my sins, wouldn't it? I'm going to ask it again. The law, if I could explain to somebody the law, and my standing under the law would clear up the question why Jesus came and died on the cross to pay my fine, wouldn't it? It would surely clear that up. Suddenly the gospel message is not offensive. Suddenly the gospel message, well let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 1.18, I read you the first part, let's read it all. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why? Because they don't know they're lawbreakers. They don't know they're lawbreakers, and they don't know the penalty for being a lawbreaker, which, by the way, is death, which is more than $25,000. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but what's it say next? But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the difference between the two, the power of God and the foolishness? Understanding that there is a law. What law? What God has established for the unrighteous to have an encounter with the righteous. For the unholy to be in the presence of the holy. There is a law. There is a law. Once the law is correctly displayed, guess what? The mouth becomes silent. I'm going to say this again. Once the law is correctly displayed, the mouth becomes silent. We've got several state police officers or several police officers in general that go to church here. Uh, several weeks ago, I was having a conversation with Mike Carnahan, one of the state policemen that goes here, and he was telling me some of the things he hears when, he, when the window rolls down. You know, when that blue light pulls up behind you and you pull over and the state cop walks up and uh, driver's license and registration. Can you imagine the first few words out of the car? What are you, what are you going to say? Let's just say, for example, in this scene, that the state policeman comes up behind you, and let's just say, for example, you're going 90 in a 55. You're really buzzing today. 90 in a 55. There is clearly posted a sign, the law, that says 5-5 five, five speed Limit, not speed suggestion, not speed ideal, speed limit, 55. But you're going 90. Blue lights come on, you pull over to the side, what are you going to say? Let me say, the Bible says this. It says that when, when the law is presented, the mouth becomes silent. So when the policeman walks up to your car, what are you going to say? Hi. I'm going 90 miles an hour. The law says 55 is the limit. What am I going to say? 
What logical thing can come out of my mouth? Have mercy. You know, what can you do? What can you do? The law is the standard. I can imagine the things they hear, but in reality, I'm guilty. Let me read it to you. It's found in Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, they understand the law, 55. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So what if you didn't know the law? Versus what if you do know the law? What if you didn't know that there was a law that made it able and possible for you to live in the presence of God? Would it make a difference? You see, when the law is made clear, the excuses and the self-justification are gone. What are you going to say to the state police officer when you in your own heart know that you're going 90 miles an hour? What are you going to say to him? Well, it's a pretty day for a fast drive, wasn't it? What are you going to say? The mouth becomes silent. Guess why? Because there is no self-justification in context of the law. There are no excuses in context with the law. Can you be a little guilty? You're going 90 and 55. Are you a little guilty? What does it mean, a little guilty? You're not a little guilty. You're guilty. You can't be a little guilty. You're either guilty or you're innocent. There's not a middle ground. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law, and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. You're not going to be a little innocent or a little guilty. If you're a lawbreaker, you're a lawbreaker. If you broke one of the laws, you broke all the laws. In Romans 3.20, what single thing reveals my guilt, my reality? Romans 3.20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. You know why? Because you can't do it. They couldn't do it in the time of Moses. What? All of them, 613 mitzvahs. Those are 613 rules that the Jewish people tried to honor. What if you broke one of them? Just, I got 612. What if I just won? What if, what if the Ten Commandments? What if I get nine? Let me read it again. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, something happens. You know what the law really does? We become conscious of sin. You know what that sign tells me when it says 55 and I'm going 90? I am a sinner. And I am subject to judgment at any moment when I see blue lights. That's what it means. The, the law makes me conscious to sin. Would it be wrong to go 90 if there's no signs? Would it be wrong to speed, whatever, te- whatever speed you want to go, if there's no, no markings, nothing that tells you what the limit is? If there's nothing that tells you about a limit, there's no limit, right? But if the law is established, then I am subject under the law. And the law doesn't do anything except reveal to me that I'm a lawbreaker. But what if you didn't know the law? And no one told you about the law? Would you be a lawbreaker if you didn't know about the law and nobody told you about the law? Would you still be a lawbreaker? Or, let me give you another option, would you still be a lawbreaker but without the knowledge that there is someone who came to pay your fine? Do you know what the modern American church doesn't want to talk about today? I'm getting close to the light bulb moment, so hang on. You know what the American church does not want to talk about today? The law. You know why? Because it seems offensive to people. Oh, we don't want to tell people about the law because then they'll be offended. If you go to somebody and tell them that they're a lawbreaker, well, they won't come back to church anymore. Because nobody wants to be told they're a lawbreaker. Well, what if I followed up and told them they're a lawbreaker, but somebody came to pay their price and they paid their fine? Wouldn't that make them? No, no, no. They're still offended by the whole idea you told them they're a lawbreaker. You know what the American church, the modern American church does not want to talk about? The law. In Romans 7, 7. By the way, Paul is writing to the Roman church in Romans 7, 7. In the church age, that's the age that we live in. This is after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. 
Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. So we have a whole generation that doesn't know what sin is because we never told them about the law. It might explain a lot what's going on today. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. When it said, do not covet, in the Ten Commandments, God posted the sign, don't do that. You won't have a life with me. I won't be able to dwell with you as a lawbreaker. These are for your benefit, not for mine, for your benefit. They allow you into my presence. And there was something put in place in the time of Moses to pay the price of the lawbreakers who didn't abide by the laws until the big price payment would come through Jesus. But the law was still the law, the thing that made us available to be in the presence of God. Galatians 3.24, so the law was put in charge. This is New Testament. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. What if the church stopped talking about the law? What would lead us to Christ? You'll find out in a moment that we might be justified by faith. 1 John 3, 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, what is sin? Come on. What is sin? Sin is lawlessness. Refusing to obey the laws. Whose laws? God's laws. That's what lawlessness is. The law doesn't help us. It just leaves us helpless. I want you to understand something. The law doesn't help us. In itself, it doesn't help us. Why? Because I can't keep all of them. And if I break one, I break them all. The law left me helpless. So God could abandon us? No. He could have abandoned us already so that I might know that I need somebody to go pay my fine. That's what the law was supposed to do to reveal my need for a fine payer. Someone to pay. Now, here here we go. I'm getting into the light bulb moment. This is it. There has been a shift in the presentation of the gospel in the American church. It is subtle. I don't know that anybody in this room has noticed it. Maybe you have. But I'm going to tell you, I am convinced that this is the light bulb moment. There has been a shift in the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the American church. It used to be the revealing of the law. That was the gospel. But now something has taken its place. Now it is called life enhancement. We have moved away from the revealing of the law to life enhancement. Now, here's the illustration that proves the point I just gave you. That the church, the modern American church, at one time, it preached the gospel of Christ based upon the laws of God that it would require to revive the soul of man by putting it in the presence of God. And that became offensive to people. Don't call me a lawbreaker. And it's replaced with what? Life enhancement. Here's the light bulb moment illustration. Two men are seated on a plane. The first is given a parachute and told that this parachute will improve your flight. He's a little skeptical at first. How can a parachute possibly improve my flight? After a while, he decided to experiment and see what if the claim were true. As he put on the parachute, he noticed that the parachute was heavy, uncomfortable, and made it very difficult to set up right. Have you ever tried to sit in the seat with a parachute on your back? He he trusts the plane's management that told him that the parachute would do what? Improve his flight. So he gives it some time. As he sits uncomfortably, well, of course he's uncomfortable because he's sitting with a parachute on his back in a plane seat. As he sits uncomfortably, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him because he's wearing a parachute in a plane. He begins to feel humiliated and embarrassed. He can stand it no longer. He removes the parachute, throws it on the floor. Disillusionment fills his heart because he feels like he's been told an outright lie. That parachute didn't improve my flight. It made me uncomfortable. There's a second man on the plane. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he is told. He is told to put it on because at any moment he would be jumping 25,000 feet out of a plane. 
He gratefully puts it on and doesn't care or complain about its weight or that he can't sit upright in the seat because there's a parachute on his back. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without the parachute. Let's analyze each passenger's motive and then analyze their experience with the parachute. The first man's motive The first man's motive to put the parachute on was solely to improve his flight. The result of this experience was humiliation, disillusionment, and bitterness toward those who gave him the parachute in the first place. As far as he was concerned, it would be a long time before anybody gets me to put one of those parachutes on again. I'm done with the parachute business. But the second guy? The second man put the parachute on solely to escape the jump. The jump that they told him was coming. Because of his knowledge of what would happen to him at the end of a 25,000 foot fall, he has joy, comfort, and peace in his heart because he knows that the parachute can save him from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers, the discomfort while sitting in the seat with a parachute on your back on the journey, and his heart is filled with gratitude toward the one that gave him the parachute in the first place. Now, listen to the modern American church gospel of today. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and He will give you love, joy, peace, comfort, fulfillment, lasting happiness, and possibly a nice car and a house. In other words, you know what the modern American church is preaching today? Jesus will improve your flight. This is the message that is being preached in many churches across the land. The sinner responds. Let's analyze it. The sinner responds, puts on the Jesus parachute like an experiment, and what does he get? Everybody ought to be smiling right now. He put on the Jesus parachute. He's going to improve your flight. Everything's going to be fun. Get Jesus. Get baptized. Woo! And what does he get? Temptation, persecution, suffering, tribulation. Others mock him, make fun of him. So what does he do? So many people, what do they do? He takes off the Lord Jesus. He is offended by those who lied to him. And he lives in bitterness. And I would say rightly so. Because he was lied to. He was promised peace, love, fulfillment, joy, and happiness. And all he got was trials and humiliation. His bitterness. Listen, this describes the American culture to the T. You know who he's mad at? His bitterness is directed toward the parachute parachute packing good news people. Those parachute packing good news people. Somebody else tries to give me a parachute. I'm going to punch them in the nose. Because you know what the idea is. I'm going to give you a parachute because it's going to improve your flight. I put that parachute on. All I got was trouble. Parachute packing good news people. And listen to them. And guess what? His end is worse than his beginning. Another disillusioned, bitter, angry backslider. Instead of preaching that Jesus improves the flight, we need to be warning the passengers that they're going to have to jump out of the plane. Do you know how I know? Because God told me. I read it in the book that He wrote for us to read. God said this in Hebrews 9, 7, Just as man is destined to die once, and after that, face the judgment. It is your destiny. It is my destiny. Man is destined to die once, and after that, you're going to face judgment. Everybody, I'm going to look at everybody in the room. I'm going to tell you something. You are going to jump out of the plane. Yes, you are. You can close your eyes. You can close your ears. You can stick your head in the sand, and you're going to jump out of the plane. When a sinner recognizes the bitter consequences, the judgment, of breaking God's law. He will run to the Savior solely to escape the wrath that is to come. This is the truth that saves lives. I will tell you, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ that has harvested souls for 2,000 years based upon the law of God. I'm a lawbreaker. 
Lawbreakers don't spend forever in the presence of God. Something has to change. Somebody's going to have to pay off my debt. Somebody's going to have to pay off my fine. But if I never tell them about the law, if I never tell them that they're lawbreakers, if people never believe there is a law or a law that's broken, or someone to pay the penalty, why would they ever come to God? This is the truth that has harvested souls for 2,000 years. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is wrath and judgment coming on a day that each of us will experience. There's wrath and judgment for those who, what? Do not have a parachute when it's time to jump out of the plane. And everybody's going to jump out of the plane. You know what God commands everybody to do? It's not just an Old Testament, Moses, tabernacle, temple, burning animal sacrifice stuff. I'm talking about New Testament, after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. You know what God commands everybody to do? Paul is preaching to the Athens church in Athens, to the Greek people. Here's what he says. In the past, Acts 17.30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now, in the church age, He commands all people everywhere to what? What's the next word? How are they going to repent if they didn't know they broke the law? To them it's foolishness. Why repent? Repent from what? You're a lawbreaker. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is breaking the laws that God put in place so that God could dwell in the presence of man. Laws. God commands everyone, everywhere to repent. Why? Because He has appointed a day that He will judge the world. And everybody listen to what I'm going to say. He has appointed a day that He will judge the world in righteousness. You know what righteousness is? It's doing what is right. Doing what is right against what standard? The standard of the law. You think it's going to matter? I think it is going to matter. To do what is right. Well, what if I break the law? What if I broke one? I broke them all. I'm a lawbreaker. I'm a sinner. What am I going to do? I'm going to find a parachute. Because there is a parachute available for lawbreakers. Then guess what? We're all lawbreakers. So I need a parachute. Well, what if nobody tells you about the law? Well, you won't ever put on a parachute. You'll find that parachute uncomfortable. Or somebody even worse tells you that this will improve your flight. You'll put it on for a little while and you'll think, look, this hurts. Get rid of that thing. No one in the future, you're going to jump 25,000 feet. What are you going to do then? Oh, I'll try to get a parachute again real quick. Might be too late then. Psalms 9, 8. He will judge the world in righteousness. And I'm going to tell you, listen, he's not going to grade on the curve. So if you're right now thinking, if you're measuring your life, your goodness as somehow or another, well, you know what, I'm better than Bob down the street. Bob's a pretty good guy, but I'm as good as Bob. You're not going to be measured against Bob. You're not going to be measured against Sue or Billy. You know who you're going to be measured against? Jesus. The perfect man. God's not grading on the curve. He's going to judge the world. Put up Psalms 9-8 again. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. Acts 17-31. For he, God, has set a day that he will judge the world with justice. Justice, what court? What law? His law. His court. He will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. His name is Jesus. He's the standard. You know what? He is righteous. You know what righteous means again? To do what is right. How many times? All the time. Well, that means all of us are unrighteous, right? Because I've never done all that is right all the time. I have broken, transgressed. I'm a lawbreaker. I'm a sinner. What if there was a man who was perfect, who never broke a law, who lived under the law in obedience to the law, never was a lawbreaker, thus and never was a sinner? If he went to the courthouse to pay your fine, my goodness, he'd have clout, wouldn't he, before the judge. Acts 17, 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. The issue for today, the issue for right now in the world we live is not happiness. I'm going to tell you what, there is so much feel-good gospel being preached 
you know what? I want to feel good. I want you to feel good. I don't want to beat you up. I hope you don't want to beat me up. But I love you enough to tell you the truth. And here's the truth. What we're going to be judged by will not be our happiness. It will be our righteousness. Well, I already said I don't have any righteousness. Then I better find some somewhere besides mine. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how happy you are in this world. Without righteousness, you're going to perish in the day of wrath that's coming. How happy can you be right now knowing that over the next hill in your future is a lake of burning sulfur? How happy are you right now? Well, I had 10 good years before I got in the lake of burning sulfur. How can you be optimistic about that future? How happy would happy be enough to be happy enough to be lost? It's not about happiness. It's not about eating and drinking or about the things the world has to offer. You know what he says one more time? For the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Is there something to be said for peace and joy? Yes. When I was writing this, one of the things I was afraid of, that people would think, well, that means I should be miserable while I'm in Jesus. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean you should be miserable, but it doesn't mean all of your, come to Jesus and all your circumstances are somehow or another going to be perfect. It's not. Why do you think Jesus said they'll hate you because of me? In this life, in this world, you will have trouble, but I've overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Why do you think he's telling us all these things? Because you're going to have trouble if you follow him. He says we don't receive Christ to improve the flight. We receive Christ because of what's at the end of the flight. There's a difference. We cannot and should not use peace and joy to draw people to Jesus. Why? If we do, sinners will respond with an impure motive and they will lack, listen, genuine repentance. Why? Because they took Jesus into their life because they thought it would improve their flight. It'll get me a nice car, a nice house. I heard the preacher say so. I remember one day I was watching, one Sunday night I turned on the television, there was a preacher, I'm not going to mention his name. I heard him specifically say that, that the Lord had given him this beautiful mansion. And I'm just thinking how many people around him heard him say that and say, that's the Jesus I want. The one that gives me the mansion, gives me the big cars, it'll improve my flight. Really? What happens if you lack genuine repentance? And you never acknowledge that you broke the law. And thus you never put on a righteousness other than your own righteousness. Remember the second passenger in our story? Why he had peace and joy in his heart? He knew that parachute was going to save him from sure death. That's why. You want, you want to have peace and joy? Know that you've got a parachute that's going to save you from sure death in the future. That's peace and that's joy. Right now, I can honestly say that I have peace and joy because I know the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver me from the wrath and judgment of God that is soon to come. What do you think the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit promises? You know what the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians is? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. What do you think that means? Is there something about love, joy, peace, patience? I have it. But that doesn't mean that everything in my circumstance is going to be rosy when I come to Jesus. Now, one more time. We're going to go to the story. And I tell you, today, I want you to get it. I have a real parachute. You know how hard it is to find a real parachute? I have a real parachute from a friend of mine over in Campbellsville that's a pilot. And I want everyone, when you leave here today, to get it. I want you to get what this parachute really is. This parachute is the righteousness of Christ, okay? This is a real, real parachute. I want to go to the plane scene. And I want to give you an illustration. There's a brand new, first day on the job stewardess, back on the plane scene, first man, second man. But this day, there is a brand new first day on the job stewardess on the same flight. 
She's carrying a pot of boiling hot coffee. She's walking up the aisle. She trips and she spills the boiling hot coffee on the second passenger in our story. Remember him? He's not the guy who took on the parachute to improve his flight. He put on the parachute because why? They told him there was a 25,000 foot jump coming. She trips and spills the boiling hot coffee on the second passenger in the story. Does he say, wow, that hurt? Yeah, he does. He's alive. So he says, wow, that hurts. Does he scream in pain, grab the parachute, throw it on the floor and say, that stupid parachute? No. You know why? Because he didn't put on the parachute to improve his flight. He put on the parachute to save him from the jump that was coming and the hot coffee has nothing to do with the jump. If anything, this hot coffee incident makes him cling even tighter to the parachute and given enough stewardesses that are clumsy, he'll even look forward to the jump. <laughs> Big truth, number one. Everybody listen. Big truth. If you and I put on this parachute called the righteousness of Christ, I want you to understand what the point of all of this is. If you and I put on this parachute called the righteousness of Christ, I'm not going to get angry at God or lose my joy and peace because I face troubles and trials. I'm going to cling even tighter to the parachute. Guess what? The more I face hardship, the tighter I hang on to this parachute. The more trouble that's in my life, the more I'm thankful that I've got on the parachute. I didn't come to Jesus for a happy lifestyle. I praise God nobody told me that line. I'm fearful what would have happened to me if somebody gave me that line. And you know, compared to deny yourself, take up a cross and follow me, the improve your flight sounds better. I came to Jesus to flee the coming wrath and judgment of God. Because I knew one day I was going to have to jump. I came to Jesus because I acknowledged that I'm a sinner. I'm a lawbreaker. And I am unrighteous. And he offered me his righteousness to put on me. You mean your perfect righteousness? Yeah, I'm going to go into the courthouse of God's throne room and pay your fine. Yes, Lord. I came to Jesus to flee the coming wrath and judgment of God. If anything, the troubles of this life, I'm going to be honest, have driven me closer to Christ, not further away. Why? Because when I came, I didn't think it would make my life easier. My experience, you know what my experience is? It's harder. But it's worth it. It's the only thing that's worth it because it is the only road that leads to life. Big truth number two, we have multitudes of backsliders today in the church all around the land. They are the product of a man-centered gospel that has refused to proclaim the law of God and the righteousness of Christ. They came to Jesus lacking repentance, looking for a happy life and self-satisfaction, and they found what? Disillusionment. Turned away from God. Turned away from the church. And even they looked in at the parachute packing people, and they're mad at them. They don't even know why they're mad at them. Without the repentance that comes from the reality of the law, and the fact that I'm a lawbreaker, breaker, there is no forgiveness. And without forgiveness, I'm going to tell you the truth, without forgiveness, no one will be saved. Unrighteousness cannot dwell with righteousness. Unholiness cannot dwell with holiness. There must be a pardon. There must be forgiveness. There must be somebody that pays the price. Somebody's got to pay. You know what the price is? What was the penalty for sin, breaking the law? Death. Sin equals death. Somebody would have to die. It is the proud and the self-righteous that reject this parachute. The humble and the weak openly acknowledge their sin and they repent. James 4, 6. But He gives us more grace. That's why the Scripture says God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, 
I want you to look at this scene. When Jesus is baptized, he's 30 years old, baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit comes upon him in power. You know what? The first thing that happens to Jesus after the baptism, it says he is thrust into the wilderness, led by the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness, what? For 40 days he faces Satan face to face. Tempted, tormented, 40 days in the wilderness. When he leaves the wilderness, the Bible says the Holy Spirit took him in the power of the Holy Spirit, don't miss that, back to his hometown of Nazareth. He goes to his hometown where he grows up, goes into the Jewish synagogue, and this scene occurs. Now, just picture the scene. He's 30 years old. Baptism, testing in the wilderness. He's gone to Nazareth. Luke 4, 16. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. As he stood to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Now, this is a 600-year-old prophetic writing of Isaiah, 600 years before Jesus. He rolls the scroll. This is what happens. Unrolling it, he, Jesus, found the place where it is written. You ready for this? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll after reading that, goes over, sits down, and he says these words. Today, this scripture, the 600-year-old prophetic announcement from Isaiah is fulfilled in your presence. He said, I am the Messiah. This is me. This is the town he grew up in. They were struggling with the whole idea that he is the Messiah. Now, I want to do something here. I want to give you the roughest paraphrase you have ever heard of this verse. Here it is. Jesus says, God has anointed and appointed me to come into the world and pass out parachutes. I'm here. This is the plan of God. I'm packing parachutes called my righteousness. And I'm offering them to anyone that they might be set free from the fall. That's what he's announcing. The Lord has anointed me to pass out my righteousness to the unrighteousness. The parachute is the righteousness of Jesus. You're not going to make it without his righteousness. I'm telling you, Romans 3.21 says this. This is church age. This is our day right now. But now, a righteousness from God. This is it. This illustrates the righteousness of Christ. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, remember, the law only showed me my sin. Apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who will believe. There's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption, through the parachute that came by Christ Jesus. The gospel, the message that Jesus sent to the church out into the world to preach is this. The righteousness of Christ is your salvation. It is your parachute. The law and the prophets have revealed to all, every one of us in this room, that we are all lawbreakers. All of us are sinners. Jesus didn't come to die on a cross to improve my flight. Jesus did not come down a cross to improve your flight, to make your life easy. It is not the truth. He came, listen, to save you from the fall. That's why He came. The fall, you can look at it in two ways. One is the fall of Adam and Eve. It's called the fall of man. When sin entered mankind and separation from God began. Right now, we're on the plane. It's us. It's our day. One of these days, you're going to jump. I'm going to jump. I'm going to ask you a, a simple question in light of the gospel that's being preached and the falling away, the apostasy. Can anybody in this room right now with me imagine putting on this, understanding what it is, that I'm a lawbreaker, I've broken the law, that separates me from God. Jesus died, went into God's courthouse, died 
shed his own blood to make the payment for me, for you. I'm wearing the righteousness of Jesus. I'm wearing the holiness of Jesus. Can anybody now imagine me putting this on and desiring to live in willful sin and rebellion against God? That that's the desire and goal of my heart? You know what it's like? It's like asking Jesus to get back up on the cross again. Here, here, I want to do this. And you, you said you were going to prove my life. Get back on the cross again. Can you imagine placing the righteousness of Christ in your life? He paid with His own life my penalty. And then I want to willfully sin against Him. Will I sin? Yes, I will. I will stumble. But I will stand up. I will confess that sin. Repent of that sin. Turn to Him and ask His righteousness to cover that sin. I won't stand in open rebellion against the very thing that saved my soul. I can't even imagine that ideal which is being preached today, along with the idea that he'll make you improve your flight. Jesus came to pay my fine. I was a lawbreaker, and the fine is death. Jesus died. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin. You know what? How many sins did Jesus have? Zero. How many laws did he break? Zero. Perfect. God made him who had no sin to be sin. My sin, your sin, was placed on Him to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. I'll have to put it on for that to happen. It won't happen because of me. Very soon, I'll close with this thought. Very soon, in light of eternity, it's really soon. Very, very soon. I'm looking around the room today. We're going to jump. Everybody's going to jump. The graveyards in Anderson County give testimony that everybody jumps. Who do you know over 120? They all jumped. Very soon we're going to jump. Either through the return of Christ or through physical death, each of us are going to jump. You can't deny it. At the end of that jump, we will all find ourselves before the judgment of God. The only question today is this. Will you be wearing the righteousness of Christ's parachute when you jump? I'm going to ask Chad to come on out. I'm asking it right now. If you were called to jump today, do you know you are wearing the righteousness of Christ? It's yes or no. There's no gray area. It's yes or it's no. I can tell you this. This thing, the righteousness of Christ, is the only thing that will save you from the fall. And you're going to jump. So we're going to offer an invitation. We offered an invitation in the first service. I think we had five people baptized this morning in the first service. Why? Because people realize, you know what? This is not the feel-good gospel that's being proclaimed causing the great apostasy of the church. This is the truth. The law of God has enabled us the presence of God. But we became lawbreakers and somebody came and they went to the courthouse of God's throne and they paid our penalty so that you and I could wear the parachute for the day we're called to jump. Invitations open. Stand.
Welcome. 